On January 1, 1911, the Boy Scouts of America accomplished two major goals. They opened the first national headquarters office at 205th Avenue in New York City. The building became the center for the U.S. toy industry during World War I, following restrictions on imports from German toy manufacturers. Come World War II and additional restrictions on toy imports from Japan, the majority of the toy industry's major companies had moved into the toy center. Business conducted in this location accounted for 95% of all toy transactions in the United States. The second major accomplishment was the hiring of James E. West as the organization's executive secretary. West was stepping into a role to help bring structure and professionalism to an organization trying to harness the excitement of the scouting movement in the United States. 44 days after he assumed the position, on February 14th, James E. West presented what amounts to the first annual report to the National Council at their first ever meeting at the new Willard Hotel in Washington, D.C. In his report, West talks about the number of youth and adults associated with the BSA and about the need for printed materials to help administer the program of scouting throughout the country. It's the first official mention of the Handbook for Boys and the Scoutmaster's Handbook. While there was a rush to produce the first Scout Handbook and get it in the hands of boys, it was decided to take a much more measured approach to producing the Scoutmaster's Handbook. We'll learn more about the Scoutmaster's Handbook in this edition of Artifact of the Week. On January 1st, 1911, the BSA had officially been in business for just under a year. A group of men known as the Committee on Organization, chaired by Ernest Thompson Seton, was formed from the representatives of the 35 organizations that agreed to come together as the Boy Scouts of America. The committee was charged with the executive duty of supervising the movement in its development and inviting men of national importance to serve on a national council, which would advise the organization in the direction of the movement. One of the major challenges the committee faced was the rapid growth of scouting across the country and the need for an orderly method of organizing and operating something this organic. In the BSA's first annual report, West states, The work in the field has grown apace, so that at the present time there are 4,000 scoutmasters or adult leaders connected with the organization, 2,000 of whom are actually registered at headquarters receiving scoutmasters certificates. A most conservative estimate would place the number of boys enrolled in the movement at approximately 300,000. There are approximately 200 local councils composed of representative businessmen of all sects and creeds giving their attention to the supervision of the movement in the cities, towns, and counties in the United States. The committee chose to be very methodical in its approach. West report continues, the demand for information from all parts of the country compelled us to produce a great deal of literature in order to give working details of the movement in its relationship to the boys. Our six bulletins were prepared for this purpose, and because of the pressure of demand, a hastily compiled manual was prepared by Mr. Ernest Thompson Seton and put on the market as the official handbook of the movement. Of course, this is a reference to the first edition of the Scout Handbook. A little further into the report, Wes says, at the present time, there are two official manuals in preparation in which we hope there will be a distinct American spirit in keeping with the genius of the Boy Scout movement. One of these official handbook will be for Scoutmasters, giving them instructions as to how to carry on the work of scouting amongst boys. The other book is being prepared for the boys, thus taking the place of the present official Scout manual. Of course, West is talking about the Scoutmasters handbook and the 1911 edition of the Scout handbook. In the second annual report, published in February 1912, West writes, By far the most important task that has been accomplished since our last meeting has been the production of the various bulletins, handbooks for boys, and programs for scoutmasters, which have just been distributed. There is a specific entry in the annual report about the development of the scoutmaster's handbook. It says, There is considerable impatience throughout the country at the present time because of the delay in sending out a scoutmaster's manual. Members of the editorial board and the executive force are in a position to appreciate more keenly than others the necessity for help along this line, but it was deemed wise to pursue the same course in the production of this book as was followed with the Handbook for Boys. The material thus far available has not been acceptable. Progress has been made, however. It was decided instead of getting out one book to issue a series of pamphlets, 
The first of these in proof form, consisting of 25 programs for Scoutmasters, is now being distributed. This will be followed as soon as possible with other pamphlets covering special subjects. Suggestions are earnestly solicited. In the third annual report presented in February 1913, the Scoutmaster's Handbook is mentioned along with the discussion of the Scoutmaster's training courses. The report of Professor Jeremiah W. Jenks, Chairman of the Committee on Scoutmaster's Training Courses, defines the present responsibility of the national organization with reference to this subject. Several plans were considered by the committee, among them a correspondence course and a number of summer schools. A review has been made of the expense involved and the members attending the training schools heretofore conducted under the auspices of the national headquarters, particularly the ones held at Cost Cobb and Silver Bay last year. It was recommended that the national headquarters should confine its efforts for the time being to the printing and distributing of material which will be helpful to Scoutmasters. A step in this direction was the preparation of the Scoutmasters manual together with the plan for the various pamphlets devoted to each one of the subjects covered in scouting. The report goes on to say, Early in March, a proof copy of 25 programs was distributed without charge to every enrolled Scoutmaster. This service on the part of the National Headquarters to the men in the field was much appreciated. The handbook for Scoutmasters for which page proof is just being read will be sold at 60 cents a copy. Now at least 15,000 copies of the proof book were published and distributed in 1912 and 1913, with page counts ranging from 161 for the second and third printings to 344 for the 1913 proof edition. While it was reported in 1913 that the price would be 60 cents for the proof copy, they were in fact sold for 25 cents a copy. In 1914, the official first edition of the Scoutmaster's Handbook was released after allowing Scoutmasters and others to review and comment on the proof edition of 1913. The editorial board was pleasantly surprised to learn that active scoutmasters in the field found the handbook to be a good resource full of helpful information and advice. Initially, there were 10,000 copies printed and they were sold for 50 cents, or you could have it mailed to you for 60 cents. The handbook is listed as being published under the supervision of the editorial board representing the National Council. Despite baden polls recommendation that military-style marching and drill not be a part of scouting, the handbook contains a section on marching and drill, as well as a page and a half on order of the staff, which is an almost identical copy of the Army's drill with rifles. The first edition was produced in six printings and was used until 1920 when the second edition was released. The cover of the second edition carries the first class emblem and the subtitle, A Manual of Leadership. There remains a chapter on marching and drill, but the, on page 138, the Scoutmaster has provided some guidance on the appropriate use of drill in the program. Of particular interest is the precautionary entry. A Scout Troop is not a military organization. Marching drill should never be allowed to supersede the other and more vital phases of the Scout program. Drill has an important but minor place in the program. Keep it in its place. Make the drill short and snappy. Note the emphasis placed on the last two parts of the precaution section. The second edition was considered very thorough and had a copy of the Federal Charter included as well as the Constitution and Bylaws of the BSA for reference and varied from 608 to as many as 676 pages, which was the page count from 1926 to 1930. The third edition of the Scoutmaster's Handbook was published from 1936 to 1947 and was authored by Green Bar Bill Hillcourt. This edition was the only two-volume handbook until 2015. Interestingly, Volume 1 and 2 were never printed at the same time. There were 13 printings of Volume 1, but only 11 printings of Volume 2. While the second edition is considered an excellent resource, this edition was an even more extensive and thorough reading. Both volumes start with a presentation note where credit is given to Hillcourt for writing and research, but includes that all scout literature represents the work of many persons based upon actual experience over a period of years. In keeping with the writing style of Hillcourt, each of the chapters is called a chat. He's just sharing information with a peer, not telling others it must be done in a certain way. Like the previous editions, there are plenty of black and white photographs along with many illustrations by Remington Schuler. Interestingly, the illustration on page 229 has been reversed to give the illusion of the scouts shaking with their left hands. If the patch placement didn't give it away to the uniform police, then the backward signature of the artist surely will. The fourth edition debuted in 1947 with 415,000 copies printed between then and 1959. 
This represents the second edition penned by Bill Hillcourt, and the cover artwork was done by BSA art director Don Ross. For the first six printings, the Scoutmaster and Scout were shown with the campaign hat, and the last five printings, the hat changed to the overseas or garrison cap. The fourth edition was back to a single volume, with the information found in the previous volume two now in a separate 150-page section called the Scoutmaster's Tool Chest. The fifth edition was also authored by Bill Hillcourt and featured one of the most famous covers of any BSA publication, Norman Rockwell's painting of the Scoutmaster. More than half a million copies were printed between 1960 and 1972, with the most significant change being the addition of a tool titled Taking Over an Old Troop. The sixth edition came out in 1973 to introduce Scoutmasters to the improved scouting program of the 1970s. Ranks became Progress Awards, Scoutmasters Conferences became the Personal Growth Agreement Conference, and these changes, along with a de-emphasis of the outdoor program elements, saw the BSA's membership plummet. The handbook was produced on recycled paper and contained no photographs, only cartoonish illustrations in a black, white, and green palette. While more than 400,000 copies were printed, it could be purchased as a standalone book or as part of the Scoutmasters Library with other BSA literature. The seventh edition was printed from 1981 to 1990 and featured a full-color reproduction of Joseph Satari's painting of a Scoutmaster teaching first aid. The contents are divided into three sections, leading the troop, helping the boy, and tools to do the job. A quick reference key and page end marks are intended to make finding information easier. Nearly 300,000 copies were printed over eight printings. Despite the horrible photo on the cover, the 1990 version of the Scoutmaster's Handbook is a serviceable resource for Scoutmasters. The material in chapters 1 through 9 was written by James Moyce, a Scoutmaster and retired professional scouter. Chapter 10 is credited to Linda Glosson and the Center for Youth Development and Research at the University of Minnesota. Chapters 11 through 14 are listed as revised and updated from the 7th edition. The 1990 version runs until 1998 and marks the last time the BSA refers to the handbook with an edition number. In 1998, the Scoutmaster Handbook took on a new look with an 8.5 by 11 inch size page and hole punch to be added to a three ring binder. In an effort to make the book more appealing to leaders other than Scoutmasters, the words recommended for all leaders appears on the cover and the title page. The handbook is filled with color photographs, Robert Berkby, author of the 10th, 11th, and 12th editions of the Scout Handbook, wrote this version of the Scoutmaster's Handbook. This version of the handbook was replaced in 2015 by a new two-volume edition, the first since 1936. It is also retitled as the Troop Leader Guidebook. Volume 1 was released in July of 2015, two years later than planned, and Volume 2 was released in July 2016, three years behind schedule. Volume 1 was intended for new leaders, while Volume 2 was aimed at more experienced leaders. They both retain the 8.5 by 11 format and the need for a three-ring binder. Mark Ray, the author of the 13th and 14th editions of the Scout Handbook, wrote both volumes, with Robert Berkby being credited as a contributor. In 2019, to coincide with the addition of females in the Scouts BSA program, the Leader Guidebook was updated with new photos and minor changes occurred for various topics. Information on Tread Lightly has also been added. So there you have it. The history and evolution of the book designed to help volunteer leaders deliver the Scouts BSA program to the Scouts in our troops. By the way, today you can purchase electronic versions of the Troop Leader Guidebook, which arguably makes it easier to take on a camp out or adventure loaded on your mobile device rather than the bulkier three ring binder version. Well, that's all the time we have for this week. Join us next time as we continue to learn more about the history of the BSA through the collection of the National Scouting Museum and Artifact of the Week.